What the Tech is brought to you by Text Expander helps you communicate smarter. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast for 20% off your first year. Cybercrime is all over the news. Hackable, an original podcast from McAfee, answers the question, how worried should I really be? Listen on all major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, and learn if your personal devices put you to risk. Listen and subscribe to Hackable wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarin. Of course, I'm joined by Mr. Paul Therod. How you doing, Paul? Pretty good. How are you? I am broadcasting live from the casting couch at at, uh, at Epcot. Apparently, that's where I'm at. Right. Now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nice uh, to see you on one of the next Disney kids shows. Yeah, this is a new set that I actually built here in Manhattan, in New York City, and I thought it would be. Uh, I was, I was. We had to. We were having a lot of scheduling issues between me running around in meetings, and then you're traveling. So we definitely wanted to get a show out today, and I am uh, recording live from one of the offices that I built a studio in for a sports podcast that they're going to be doing. And I, I'm actually really impressed how well this worked. I'm doing this on a laptop. Uh, we are not live. I could have gone live. I was just concerned how the you know the CPU would handle and all that stuff. This machine that I have here that I have for remote shows is unbelievable. I'll, I'll talk about it later on in the show. This is what I used to produce all the shows in Manchester when I was in the UK. But Paul is in Pennsylvania. Uh, you are not traveling yet. You will be soon, correct? Yeah, next week, a week from tomorrow, we leave for our summer home swap. Next week you leave for that. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know how we're going to do the schedule, but I'm sure we'll figure it out uh, in the coming, I guess in the coming days, what what, what days we're going to do. And I'm sure Brad is going to do one, and I think Mary Jo Foley mm-hmm. will do one as well. Generally, I think that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm excited to do it. There is a ton of tech stuff to talk about. Uh, for the summer, it's actually not common that this happens. And I was very surprised <laughs> right, when I right. looked at the notes over the last week that we compiled. Uh, last week, we were off for the holiday, obviously. But I'm very surprised at the stuff to talk about. And I do want to get your opinion on stuff. And I also want to know what you're traveling with this year. Because every year we do this, and I ask you the question, what are you traveling with? And it seems yeah. to get lighter and lighter. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, so do uh, you want you want to know right now? No, 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 <laughs> so, no, no, no. We'll, we'll go um, into that, obviously. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll go into that. But before we continue, yep. I want to thank our sponsor. And this is an amazing podcast. Many of you guys have emailed me about Hackable, a podcast from McAfee that answers the questions, how worried should we really be when it comes to cybersecurity and our personal security when it comes to things that we do online? Uh, they, they, these guys have tested everything from laptops to webcams to drones uh, Paul, are you one of those guys that puts a a little sticker over your webcam? No. You're not. I have to tell you, I know so many people that have that fear. Oh, yeah. And there's stickers all over the place. I'm not one of those people, uh, but a lot of people have this concern, and for a long time I thought they were just nuts, and in reality, they should be concerned. Uh, on yeah. What to Tech, for example, we talk about you know the greatest connected devices where we're constantly talking about iPhones and everything else, you know, the the, the Internet of Things, essentially. But... Does the emerging technology in our homes, pockets, and purses leave us vulnerable? I told the story a couple of weeks ago. My friend Dara, the skinny pig, uh, she was totally compromised from just basic uh, social engineering with a phone call. Uh, there's, no, there's no antivirus or malware protection you can install to protect you from that. But if you're kind of in the know, you would know what to do. This show is, kind, is, is, is really awesome. It's kind of like Mr. Robot uh, meeting Mythbusters. Which is a really interesting blend of stuff. Uh, I, I love these guys. They're available everywhere. Podcasts are available, including uh, Spotify and, of course, uh, and of course the uh, Apple Podcast uh, directory. Uh, everywhere you could imagine. Check them out. It's called Hackable. I absolutely love this podcast. I became hooked on it, uh, and uh, it answers a lot of these questions that a lot of us have. Like, is Paul spying on me? I think about that constantly. <laughs> I think you're just monitoring my all my yeah. moves. I'm not busy enough. I spy on people. <laughs> That's what I do. 
Um, so I kind of want to ask you about what you're going to be bringing with you because a lot of people yeah. have this have this question every year. You kind of do this write up. I don't know if you you did it last year. Did you do it? What you were traveling? Yeah, with? no, I, yeah, I always do something. And yeah. uh, it it becomes less and less in my opinion. Before you used to bring multiple laptops and different keyboards. <sighs> what what are you traveling with this year? Um. I am actually going to bring multiple laptops this year because I'm in the middle of so many different things. You know, I've got uh, the book that I'm updating for 1903. I've got this programming Windows series I'm doing over on Therat.com that requires a lot of virtual machines and, you know, whatever. So I haven't locked it down completely. I will say my main computer will be Surface Book 2. And then the question is going to be the other one. And I, I've got some... Some really awesome, like small and light. In fact, I've got one here. This is a good opportunity. This one, I'll probably write something about this today or tomorrow. But this is an Acer Swift Seven. Oh, nice. and This thing is super, super thin and light. It's amazing, and um, you know, it's uh, it's a fourteen inch screen. If you can believe it, it looks like it's like a thirteen inch or twelve inch laptop. Uh, Core i seven processor. It's just really nice specs, and it's uh, fanless. It's and fanless. so, yeah, so it does all kinds of active uh, cooling of, you know, like a uh, siphoning of hot air and so forth. And so anyway, th that's a possibility just if only because it's so thin and light. But this Dell Attitude I would consider taking, I would consider taking the um, Surface laptop too. But there will be a second laptop and and it, we'll see. But so, yeah, the Surface, Surface Book 2 will be the key. So let me ask you this. Why, why two laptops? Um, I'm going to be gone for three weeks and I write every single day. And I cannot afford <laughs> to have something go wrong. Um, so it's kind of a backup. But the other part of it is on the Surface Book 2, uh, I have been using that to do a bunch of virtual machine stuff. So I'm really kind of loading it up with some extraneous crap. And it's been great for that. But um, I may want to just use a thinner, lighter, smaller thing, um, you know, otherwise. So it's just a... You got to understand, like, I, I, it's not a vacation, right? So I'm not like, I'm, if I was going on, even on a work trip, I would just take a single, obviously, I'd just take a laptop, right? Uh, if I was going on vacation, I would take a single, I would probably just take the, the Acer, the really small, thin, light, beautiful machine. Um, but I'm going to be gone for three weeks. I'm working. And so it, you can't see my home office here, but on my desk, I can see one, two, three, four, five, six phones. I can see, I mean, I can't even count the computers. I have dozen, I mean, probably over 20 computers in this room alone. I don't use every single one of them every day, but. Um, like one of the typical two laptop scenarios for me is going to be, because this is what I do at home is I write on this computer when I'm writing the book, there's a computer over here. You can't see, um, it's, it's configured a very particular way. Cause I want the screenshots to be consistent. So it's a 1080 P with a certain percent magnification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I take screenshots on that machine. They're sent automatically to the desktop of this machine so I can process them, put them in the right place. I will duplicate that on the road. Oh, with the second laptop. So that's that's one reason. I can't write and take screenshots at the same time because it has to be a pristine environment. It's, you know, I can't, I can't have a bunch of things running. Um, so that's one of them. Um, but uh, it's just, it, it, this is, it's kind of like a mini version of taking my office on the road, <laughs> you know, Got like it. what can fit in a bag. Actually, this laptop's so small, it can probably fit in the crack of the Surface Book too. It's like a tiny little thing. It's cute. So are you... Um, what phones are you taking with you? Are you taking yeah, all so of them? I'm also going to take multiple phones. Um, I have, so through some kind of weird circumstance this year, I have a Pixel 3a XL. That's my main phone. That will be the phone I carry day to day. Um, I also have a Pixel 3 XL, which is the higher end version. Um, both of those have eSIMs to which I can connect to Google Fi, which means it's, um, not additional cost to use them in Europe, right? So that's wonderful. I have two other Google Fi SIMs. One is a normal SIM if I wanted to switch up my main for forum like uh, phone, sorry. Um, and the other one is a data SIM. And so I'm probably going to put the data SIM. Actually, did I already do this? No. I'm probably going to put the data SIM in a uh, Huawei uh, P30 Pro. And that's oh, what I'll use to take the photos while we're traveling. And then I'll just have the... The other sim just as a backup, probably put it in the iPhone uh, just to have something different, you know, just in case something happens with iPhone. So if, I, you know, Apple releases um, new versions of iOS beta while I'm gone, I'll have the iPhone, I'll have my iPad. If Android or uh, Google releases new version of Android beta, uh, Android Q beta, I have that on the 3A XL. And it's just a. 
So it's interesting Again, it's, because it, you, you have a you have a mixed environment because some of this is for your own personal usage and your preference, yeah. and a lot of it is for work purposes. Like, there's no reason why you need to have three phones with you. Oh no, no, you know? not at all, not at all. In fact, you know, if I could, I say the the issue is I can't. I um I I uh, I don't know what I have in there right now, but I tried to put the cellular SIM for Google Fi in the in the um, P30 Pro. It's actually my favorite phone. It's not compatible. Right, so its predecessor, the Mate, well, it's the previous uh, Huawei had the Mate 30 Pro, Mate 20 Pro, 30 Pro, um, is compatible with Fi. The Huawei P30 Pro is not, so I can't even use it as my phone, um, which is unfortunate because I would just use that, frankly. Um, but there are some advantages to using the um, uh, a Google phone as the phone and the and. It has to do with network switching. It's got probably going to be a better uh, situation for being online all the time, whatever. So, yeah, like I said, I, look, I'm not going on vacation. <laughs> you know, uh, if I was, it w- I would just bring one Google phone, <laughs> you know. And you're fine. Well, yeah. I'd probably bring, I still, I'd probably still bring the Huawei in that case. And I'd bring one laptop, of course. I would travel as light as I can. But, you know, again, we're going to be there for three weeks. We're going to unload a bunch of equipment at the house. And, you know, it's not like I'm going to be carrying it around. It's just, um, yeah, but I'm, so this will all fit in a carry on. I mean, this is my, you know, my little laptop bag. So two laptops, three phones, probably four phones, maybe, and an iPad. Uh, which so I used to read. this is actually interesting, and this kind of ties into something. Uh, Google's partnering with Dish Network for a new mobile wireless carrier. Yeah, rum- uh, rumored to be. Rumored yeah. to be. Uh, mm-hmm. What what would be the advantage there? I'm curious why Dish Network and why they're looking to get another carrier. Obviously, uh, they have Project Fi as a yeah. current carrier, and that piggybacks off of T-Mobile. And and what was the other one? T-Mobile, Sprint, and uh, U.S. Cellular in the United States. Okay, so you're getting you're getting a, a, a larger, you know, mm-hmm. more broad coverage base. But yep. why yep. is this gonna is this is this gonna be an addition to that list, or are they looking to kind of drop yeah, everybody say, in one? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Google Fi today is like uh, is MV, you know, or whatever the term is. It's you know they're basically reselling uh, bandwidth from other carriers. Um, it is unique because they do the network switching. You know, most of those types of carriers are buying access to AT and T or Verizon, or whatever the service is, and you're just getting it from a different company. In this case, you you get to do the network switching. So, I think the reason Dish is interested is because uh, T-Mobile, in order to merge with Sprint is going to be required to dump some of its spectrum or whatever. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah so Dish wants to pick that up. Um, and I guess they, they've they apparently reached out to Google and, and Google is interested. And I don't know if that means it, Google Fi becomes this or if this is a separate offering. Offering, Sorry, it's it's just kind of hard to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested about this because um, Google Fi is phenomenal. Uh, I, it's, yeah, it's I love very, it. I'm I'm, tell, I'm very impressed by how well it works and how the yep. handoff works between networks. Yeah, uh, completely I've, seamless. It's it's extremely seamless, and I've experienced the handoff, and and it's and it's actually uh, surprisingly seamless. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm curious how this will be adapted in there. Obviously, people would rather use their own platform, and if you have one carry that does everything really well, it's better for you. Uh, yeah. I'm imagining oh, yeah. that's what Google's approach is. Rather than having to work with Sprint and U.S. Cellular and uh, T-Mobile, they just have one carry that could cover their ground. Yeah, uh, you know, my wife um, is on Verizon. So am I. We were out, yeah, we were out last weekend or whatever, and she said, "Hey, I got to think about what I'm going to do for this trip." And I was like, "Okay, I mean, you know, you know." And she said, "Is it, can I do something off of your phone? Because one of the things I do with the Google Fi thing is I can share the connection. And so my daughter, or my son, if he's there, or uh, my wife, if we're out in the world, they can just use the data. And I said, you know, if, if you wanted to, I mean, you could. we could get a date. We could put a data sim in your phone. We could do that for the kids, I guess. Um, but you're not going to have your phone number. And I don't know how that works on her phone exactly. If you pop the sim out and put it in a different sim, can you still access your Verizon phone number, et cetera? I don't, I don't really know. But... We're talking about at least some complexity there. And I said, you know, uh, I said, well, what does Verizon offer you? And it's it's like a day pass, right? And so I think it's yeah. once you use the data or once a phone call occurs, right, you're you're paying for the day. And I want to say the cost of the day is 10 bucks. It like is that. 10 bucks, yeah, because I just yeah. had that, yeah. And then you have your access to whatever your, your plan is, which for her is essentially unlimited, right? And so I said, well, let me ask you a question. We're going to be there for two weeks. If you use your... If you use that plan every single day, it's two hundred and ten dollars. 
And I said, you've got clients that are going to reach out to you. You've got family and friends that might have emergencies. I said, in the, in, in the scope of a three-week trip, what is $200 exactly? I mean, that's one meal with both kids in a restaurant. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, I, to me, you just keep it and you use your phone and you just don't worry about it. And when I kind of presented it like that, she was like, oh, yeah, actually, I get that it. makes yeah. tons of sense, you know, because well, it's like she's looking at that like this $200 I don't um, have to spend. And I was like, yeah, but the, the problem is going to be like on Google Fi, um, you know, up to six gigs you pay. And so the it's $90 plus, in other words, the maximum of the amount or something is going to be $90 plus whatever the taxes and fees are. And then whatever we pay for international calls, which is very small. Uh, which is nice. But then the problem, and we ran into this last summer, is if you've got everyone sharing the connection, it's free through 15 gigabytes. And then you have a choice to make. You can have, ever, ever, you could have reduced speed, uh, which is terrible, or you could um, pay start paying the fee again, you know, the $10 per gigabyte. So and I think when, we did that. When mm -hmm. I was in Europe a couple months ago, um, yep. you know, the, thing, the difference is almost every place that you go has, has Wi-Fi coverage. So. Yeah, but this is this is more about the convenience of your, your phone. In other words, I, I just said to you, for example, like like we're going to Europe for three weeks. It sounds like this highfalutin thing, like we're living some luxury lifestyle, right? But <laughs> living like the Rockefellers. Yeah, yeah, it's not like that. So we're flying coach and we're staying in someone's house. You know, like we're swapping houses. Like we're just living our lives. Like I mean, we will go out and do things most days, but um, it's not like you know we're not eating out every single meal and you know whatever. But um, you know. I, to, from the perspective of people who know us or don't know us, they can reach out to us normally and we will respond normally. And so Stephanie has, you know, she's a freelance writer. She has clients. They reach out to her. Sometimes they call, they'll text, they, however they communicate. Like your phone number needs to be available. You can't just be gone. We're not going to be gone yeah. for three weeks, right? So there would be a lot of complexity for her if she had a popper sim in and out and she would miss things perhaps and you know all that stuff so um you know two hundred dollars two ten or whatever the fit you know it, it's it's roughly what if i was by myself if i didn't share my connection i would probably go use the max and i would go above six gigs whatever it is and my total bill would be somewhere just north of 100 bucks so her total bill will be double that two hundred dollars but it's still for the convenience of keeping your number and all the things I just described, like it still makes tons of sense. And it's a far cry from the prices. We, we paid thousands of dollars uh, to be away for the summer. Oh, years in the past. ago. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And like the, the first, I don't, the, not the first year, but maybe by the third year, ATT finally offered, you know, international plans of some stripe. But I mean, they had this thing, it was like, a gigabyte of data and it was like eight hundred dollars. Oh my god! <laughs> you know, so it was it was unbelievable. Like it was horrible, and um, the, the sea change there is incredible. I mean, I wish she was on Google Fi, yeah, you know, whatever. But she happens to have a group thing with her with our kids and her parents, and you know, whatever. They're just on whatever. They're on Verizon. It's it's what it is. But um, uh, you know, so that's what they're doing. And then the, it's for the kids. I mean. They're going to have to share off of ours, and um, I don't think, you know, they're kids, right? So the phone calls and text messages, those are not things that my kids do too much. Well, what do they, fact, what I, do they use for, for text? They use WhatsApp, or are they, are they using an they app? They use or are they Snapchat doing? and Snapchat. WhatsApp, and, you know, so yeah. So it's like, all database. It's not, nothing's yeah, going over us. The only people yeah. they ever text message with are their parents, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we're going to be there, so we can, fit, you know, we'll do, we can do whatever. We can, we can use one of those other yeah. apps. Um, some other news, which uh, I really want to get your opinion on this, and this mm -hmm. is a big deal, especially in my universe, right? Because I use a Mac. Uh, Apple apparently, uh, yep. a couple of months ago, they admitted that they this is a flawed design to their keyboards. Uh, this yep. this, this butter this butterfly you know keyboard that they incorporated uh, a couple generations back is terrible, mm -hmm. and they are now looking at replacing it. A report came out that they are going with a glass fibered frame right to reinforce yep. the keys on the keyboard and it's going to allow a longer throw and well it's going to be a scissor design it's going to be a scissor design yeah so it's and not they're actually dropping the butterfly design which to me is the most interesting part was of was the previous one the like the the one that everybody gloated about was that a scissor design 
The what? What do you mean by gloated? The, pre, the, the previous generation, like the 2015 <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, models, yeah. They, were, the, before they introduced that new MacBook, which they, by the way, just got rid of, the 12-inch version, which was the first generation butterfly keyboard, their keep, like the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, was a traditional scissor design, and there was nothing wrong with it. <laughs> I mean, uh, there was nothing not, wrong. Not only was there nothing wrong with it, it was yeah. really good. Right. And, right. and that's really one of the reasons why I became a Mac user, because the keyboard, for me especially, yep. worked really well. It, it fit my hands really well, and I was able to type yep. way better on that device than I could on any other device. And no, I, 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 they, they didn't invent it, but I think they perfected it. And I think that, and you know, there are other examples. I mean, I, the Surface Book Two I was talking about has this kind of keyboard. It's beautiful. Um, Surface Lab does, uh, laptop does. The HPs we talk about sometimes do. You know, um, this is everyone does, right? It's just the keyboard, the Island style scissor keyboard. It's very, it's just, it's the standard. <laughs> you know, the thing I don't understand about it is. Nobody asked them to, to fix the keyboard. There was not a single customer who said, you know, here's the problem with your laptops. And I think that what this was was part of a, a movement with an Apple that started in Steve Jobs and never ended where everything has to be thinner, 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 thinner. And they ran into the limits of the physical size of things. And I, I personally, and I, I, I really expect this to come out, I, I think that Johnny Ive leaving Apple was partially because of this issue. I, um, I think the, the Apple's hardware designs have gone way downhill, and I don't think this should ever have come to market. They have released four generations of this keyboard to fix it. And the thing that bugs me about today, because Apple announced a couple of things related to the MacBook, right? There's a new MacBook Air. The thing only came out eight, nine months ago. Uh, it's the same product. It has a true tone display. They released a new uh, entry-level MacBook Pro 13-inch with a touch bar now, so that there were no total keyboard, you know, function key style. You don't have the cheap keyboards. one anymore. It's now all, yeah. all with the touch bar. Yeah. Although maybe it's maybe I wonder if it's an option. I didn't check, but anyway, you can get you can get at least get a touch bar on the cheap version. Uh, and they got rid of the MacBook, right? So the 12-inch MacBook is gone. Um, there are two things that bother me about all this. Uh, one is that. They just, we just found out they're getting rid of this keyboard. Every single thing I just mentioned has the old keyboard in it. There are no new keyboards. They're putting the fourth gen butterfly keyboard in all those new devices. Yikes. Um, the other one is that I just bought a MacBook Air, like at the end of last year. Like my MacBook Air, which I bought at great expense, is now completely out of date. And if I were to buy the newer, better version today, it has a better screen and it costs less. You know? Yeah, well, yeah, well and it's he, like, I. What's going on here? Like Here's this thing the weird was, thing. Yeah. They're, they're expected to introduce the scissor design, not right. in their flagship MacBook Pro. But in the Air. But in the Air in 2019 and in the Pro in 2020, this is yeah. really uh, – this is kind of backwards how they do things, right? Because they generally – Well, they updated it for back to school. I, that, that makes a little bit of sense, and they reduced the price. So, well, that, they got rid of the entry-level version, but the if you spec it out as you did before, it's a little bit cheaper. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if they do release a new version of this thing in November, December, they will have released three new Mac, MacBook Airs in one year. That's insane. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, when you, especially when you consider that previous one sat there for seven years. What was it? Five years? Whatever. Uh, six, six years. Some number of years. I Some, mean, something obscene. Something obscene that yeah. it wasn't updated. Now, he, here's a bigger question here, right? Um, Johnny Ives left. He left Apple. Uh, he's, is he working as a consultant with them now on this uh, currently? Yeah, I think that's how that works. Yeah. That's how they're doing it. Okay. So he was pretty vocal about saying that, you know, Tim Cook is not a designs guy. He doesn't oh, no, have the of same, course not. He's not he a doesn't product. have the same vision that, that Steve Jobs did, uh, you know, flaws and, and not, you know, that uh, he, he was so, he was so well, into design, he compromised functionality a, a lot of times. So here's, I think I think there's a different way. It's still ultimately going to be Tim Cook's fault, but I think the proper way to look at this is Johnny Ive and uh, Steve Jobs had something special, right? It was like Larry Bird and Kevin McHale, or you know Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan, or you know pick any tandem you want. Like sometimes can we go with the Knicks? Can we go with the Knicks? We, there, we cannot. Oh, by the like, way, the Knicks already the statistically worst. eliminated from the next season. Anyway, can we say that um, like John Starks and Patrick Ewing? <laughs> yes, John Stein. Okay, fine. Um, like I said, we, like me and you, Andrew. Yes. You know, like sometimes <laughs> two people, two, two people just mesh. 
And um, the the sum of the two is greater than the individuals. You know, there, there was just something there. But the you know one of the things that they talked a lot about those two, and and I have to say this was correct, was that good design is as much about saying no as it is about saying yes. Now they took it to extremes uh, for sure, but I think that you know there was a, a buffer on both sides of that table with those two guys. And so if Johnny Ive came in with some design, Steve Jobs would say no. You got to make this change. This is what it's wrong. And oh, okay. And you know they would they would evolve the design together. When Steve Jobs is gone, Johnny Ive doesn't have that filter anymore. And so Johnny Ive will come in with the new MacBook keyboard, and, you know, or you know, just to use one example, and present it to uh, Tim Cook and be like, "Yeah, look at this thing. It allowed us to make our laptop seven percent thinner or seventeen percent, whatever the number is." And he's like, "Yeah, cool." And uh, it's like, how come it, it feels like I'm typing on glass? Yeah, don't worry <laughs> about that. People got used to typing on glass. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, like, I, 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 I'm inventing that conversation. But, I mean, I, I think just to illustrate the point, which is simply, it's it's not just Johnny Ive going downhill. Uh, Johnny Ive needed Steve Jobs to be his best self as a designer. And Tim Cook cannot fill that role. And it's not his fault. I, I'm, I'm, it's not his fault except that it is his fault because he can't recognize that. And has never fixed it. And they did a lot of things that were wrong since Steve Jobs died, including allowing Johnny Ive to take over the software design, which they're only now recovering from. Like you can see in iOS 13, all of a sudden there's a dark mode happening. And it's like, what was this stark white, super bright UI with pink colors and all this crazy you know, stuff that went into iOS 7 and then beyond? That was what happens when you let Johnny Ive do his own thing. And I, I think... You know, I don't know how Apple recovers from this, frankly, because that tandem of those two guys is magic, and it, it's hard to re- just like Steve Jobs can never be replaced. I think Steve Jobs plus Johnny Ive can never be yeah, replaced. Yeah, you know, in it, and it, in it, it, you know, the legacy, um, the legacy that they've left behind, you know, changed the PC market. Uh, you can't, you, undoubtedly, they changed the way that mobile phones look. They change oh, yeah. the way that the PC yeah. looks. The Everything way they've overall uh, many of the Windows. things they've done. Yeah, uh, they've been they've been er, their ideas have been stolen incessantly by their competitors. Yeah, for all and their that's flaws, how you they know, were great. Uh, that's I mean, how you know. Yeah, that's how you know you got it right. They did they did a great job, but now Apple's in a very different state where they're not as competitive. They're not this revolutionary company that's changing uh, yeah. computing and yep. changing the product. They've changed every. Uh, you know, the the company has taken more of a streamlined. PC manufacturer vision. Yep. Uh, I'm I and I do think that will eventually be their downfall, lack of innovation, because they are very expensive. They're not doing anything differently than anybody else. They they've kind of hit the well, wall with that. But uh, you know, they still make great products. They make beautiful products. I, I I'm <laughs> so I, I mean I I guess I would just say I. I uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to Apple exactly. I mean, will Apple be a smaller company or less successful company? I almost certainly, but you know, we now have a really good example in Microsoft of a, a tech company that had a, an amazing run of decades where they dominated the industry, stumbled, fell, and then picked themselves up, br- brushed themselves off, recovered, and, and are hugely successful today because of other things. You know, and so I don't think like Apple services business is what it's going to be. I, you know, I. I think that will help. There'll be a little stopgap to help them get them through some of the rough patches. But um, you know, they may have they may have future success. I mean, they have so much money that they can invest and uh, research all kinds of things. And and the future, you know, who knows what's going to happen? But I mean, you know, the the short term thing, and for Tim Cook, I think for his legacy, is is going to be about how they manage what's happening right now. You know, because uh, I think they're in a tough spot. Oh, they are. I mean, they're, they're super opening successful. Up right? what, are, what are we worried about? I mean, they're making tons of money. But I mean, as far as being like, yeah, an innovator or the the part of the market that all of the other companies look up to and respect and want to be like, I mean, in some ways, I feel like it's kind of, yeah. Perception is everything at the end of the yeah. day, right? I mean, that's what yeah. it really comes down to. They, you know, uh, to kind of talk about innovation uh, and when it doesn't work, Samsung's foldable phone has become yeah. has been plagued yeah, yeah. with issues. They yep. apparently have fixed the problem, but in my opinion, is it too late for this generation of that product? Yeah, I mean, fixed. I, I, I you know, fixed the problem. But right? what does I mean, fixed uh, mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what they've done is improved the parts of the phone that were problematic. I don't think they're fixed. I think 
stuff is still going to get in there. I think screens are still going to pop out and bubble and crack and uh, it's just going to be a matter of degree. And so we'll see, you know, the, the, you know, that history is yet to be written, but, um, you know, Samsung historically has had the two tiered major product release cycle, you know, one in the spring, one in the late summer, I guess we call it a note is in uh, August. So I guess, I mean, they, you know, it's not tied to anything. They could release it whenever they want, but, um, the question is going to be whether it's tainted and then, whether most people just take a wait and see, and then we're still going to have, you know, we're still going to have problems, you know. Of course, you know it's going to be a problem. Of course, it's going to be a problem. Well, Huawei yeah. is encountering issues also, right? Huawei has has a number of issues with their foldable device. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Samsung has a, has a number of issues with their foldable device. So sure. I, I think people are just going to. It's not just the consumer, but it's also the OEMs are going to take a wait and see approach. And see how Samsung corrects this and Huawei corrects this for the next generation yeah. of products. You know, this magical Surface device that folds. We keep hearing about this. <laughs> Do you think Microsoft is that... I mean, I guess I should not say that. I was going to say, is Microsoft <laughs> that stupid to release one without seeing the uh, a proven product on the market? Yeah, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it might not be a folding device, right? It might be a two-screen device, um, which would be a much simpler thing to manufacture, so... You know, we shall see. I think at IFA, which is in September in Berlin, you're going to see Lenovo and maybe Microsoft and maybe other companies, if not Microsoft, certainly in October, talking about this stuff. And so we'll see. Like, there there will definitely be PC designs. I, I have to imagine, given how manufacturing works, that making a PC with a folding screen probably a little easier than making a phone, <laughs> just because they're bigger. Um but uh, I don't know. You know, it would, it would be interesting if 2019 came to a close and there were no folding devices, right? And I, I suppose I it's possible. I mean, we're kind of halfway through the year. You yeah, know, I you think that's going to happen. I, I think that's, that's very much so going to happen. And there's a reason yeah. why people have taken a, a wait and see approach. Apple's not stupid. I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that Apple is working on a foldable device. And I think I think there have been reports that Apple's working on a foldable device. Right. Uh, they obviously want to take the wait and see approach and have Samsung and Huawei, oh, yeah. I mean, less Huawei, but Samsung fail spectacularly, mm -hmm. fail, and then they come out with their foldable iPad. You know, and there you go. And that's all that people yeah. will remember. Nobody will remember that Samsung was first to market and how this was a revolutionary design and it was the first of its kind. Everybody will remember that Apple did it and the iPad was successful and that is the new device. And I'll put a you know a two thousand dollar price tag on it, just for an entry level. I mean that's just how yeah. it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, some other stuff that I found interesting, and maybe you could give me some more input on this. On therot.com, you had an article. I, I'm not sure if you wrote it or somebody else wrote it, but mm -hmm. it's Android notifications on Windows 10. Yeah. Uh, tell me about this because I have yet to use this on my <laughs> Windows. So this is a feature I will never use. <laughs> but the way that this works, well, actually, if you step back uh, to when Microsoft originally announced the Your Phone app for Windows 10, there were three pieces of functionality they promised. One was messaging, which makes the most sense. It's wonderful. Being able to type, you know, with a big keyboard and everything. Text messages come in. You see them. You can respond to them. You can send new ones. It's great. Um, also, photos. So the most recent 25 photos in your phone are just available. You can drag and drop, you know, copy them to the computer. That's cool. And then the third one was an Android notifications. And everything that throws up a notification slide on your on the top of your phone will appear in a list on your uh, computer. Now that one, I, 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 I mean, I do understand the point of it. Um, I assume most people who use an Android phone spend some time customizing what does and does not appear. I mean, I, I one of my, anyway, I think this is true of most people, but for me, I spend a lot of time turning off notifications, right? I, I find too. them to be very annoying. Me. Yeah. So I don't necessarily want them to come up on the phone, but on the other hand, you know, it could be something like uh, you get a like maybe if you're into Facebook, you get a Facebook notification. Someone has replied to one of your posts or something. You might want to see that on your computer. You know, it, see that that happened on your computer. Um, I don't think that you could click it and have go to Facebook on your computer. I don't yeah. think that's how it works. I'm I'm not going to use it. I don't really care. But um, I assume that it, I don't. I assume it doesn't do anything. Actually, is how it works. But so, um, I think there's a bigger story here. How Microsoft yeah. is bridging the gap between Windows and Android. Mm -hmm. And this is something, I mean, this is one of my conspiracy theories. And, and I've <laughs> right. been talking about this for a while. I, yep. I'm, I'm a, I honestly believe that we will see a Surface phone 
that is running mm-hmm. Android skin by you know with a Microsoft skin on it or a Microsoft you know a theme launcher yeah. on it. So I can I can confirm Andrew that um, there are factions within Microsoft um, that want to do just what you described. Um, they have the political power to make it happen. They there is a justification for what will easily be a one billion dollar business by revenue. And they have examples of companies like Nokia, which have licensed their brand to HMD and been able to make some great phones, actually, without much overhead on their part, right? So it's not like it was when Microsoft owned Nokia and they had all those facilities, employees, and, you know, all the cost around that. I mean, this this could be a fairly low-cost venture, you know? Um, the question is why, <laughs> you know, like what's the market for this? And if Microsoft was going to do this, if it does get approved, if it happens... I think it will be very specifically addressed at the corporate market and that they will tie, not just have all the Microsoft software on there, of course, but they'll want you to um, sign up for all the Microsoft management services from the cloud and all that kind of stuff, Microsoft 365, whatever. I have a, um, I have a friend that recently was – this is, this is kind of where the conversation started a, a couple of years ago between him and I. And we were, he was talking about how Android is getting a lot of market share amongst enterprise phone deployment. Mm-hmm. Because of the flexibility that you know your admin can put on these devices, right? You know, flexibility right. or or bog it down or, or control it. Yeah. Um, obviously, a lot of people went into the went into it with iPhones. A lot of people are a lot of companies are deploying Android phones because it's inexpensive compared to deploying iPhones to yeah. on an enterprise level. A couple hundred yeah. of them. And Microsoft has to be looking at this and saying, well, this is a market that we could do well with. This is a market that we um, could enter in considering our cloud services, our mobile services that we're offering right now. That's just, I mean, off, I mean, the whole suite on mobile and, of course, on, on desktop. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really feel that this business will be successful. Right? So... I guess what I would say is I think a better approach would be basically what they're doing right now, which is that they offer businesses a way to manage mobile devices remotely using MDM technologies um, through their enterprise mobility suite. Um, And they could basically come up with, you know, you basically build like a a profile for different handsets that make sure that that company's software is on there, that the restrictions are in there, that... If you're using uh, Microsoft off uh, um, Outlook Mobile for email, you can't forward an internal email to someone outside of your company or yeah. take a screenshot of an email or any of that stuff. Like that stuff is all there. Um, I, and I don't know that what Microsoft, you know, like a Microsoft branded phone brings to the equation, except, frankly, a confusing set of software in some cases that most people might not want. You know, like. If you, if you have uh, the need to have Microsoft Word on your phone, fine, or Outlook, great, uh, OneDrive for business or whatever it is. I mean, that stuff's all great, but do most people want to have uh, an unfamiliar Android skin called Microsoft Launcher on there? Do they want SwiftKey on there? Do they want Cortana instead of the Google Assistant or whatever? I, I think for most people, the answer is, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never heard of those things. Yeah. Or no. And so I, I, I think there might be a little bit of resistance to that because I, I feel like the, um, I guess we'll call it like the bring your own device kind of movement has kind of sailed. And what that means is I, I don't know that a company coming down on employees and saying you have to use this phone now is, can never happen again. I, I don't know. I know there will be ex- exceptions. I don't mean literally, but I mean for the most part – in a world where people are using the Samsung phone that they want or the iPhone that they want, saying, here's the Microsoft phone you don't want, I don't think it's going to work. Hey, I'm curious about that. I, I, I think there is a possibility it can work if it's done properly. Um, and, I, and I do think, again, I brand notoriety, right? And yeah. to them, it may be an entry level because now once, once, an, once enterprises now deploy these Microsoft phones... There's a good chance they're going to deploy, deploy Surface laptops and other yeah. other devices within the Microsoft system. And now, when they go to you know earnings, they're going to say, "Well, look at this: Surface devices are are, are up overall because they've deployed all these Surface devices." I, I think a lot. I, I mean, there's, yeah. there's, obviously, I I I 100% agree with you. I don't think 
as far as a, a major success, as far as, you know, user uh, user satisfaction and deployment would go. But to them, maybe this is a perception thing as well, where the brand is being perceived on the level of some other brands. Maybe. I mean, I, you know, you can make a case for Surface because they're high quality devices. They have a pretty good reputation. The other thing is, you know, Microsoft sells uh, businesses things on subscription basis already. So whether they're paying for, you know, Windows plus Office 365 plus whatever as part of some Microsoft 365 subscription for X number of dollars per user per month or per year or however they're doing it. You could add in a computer and you space it out over three or four years and it's it adds 10 bucks per user yeah. or something. You could make a, a case for that. Are you going to throw in a phone now again and for another 10 bucks or something or 20 bucks? Maybe. No, maybe. But, you know, most people already have a phone, <laughs> you know, so... I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I, I It's a tough, I, I just don't, I don't know. I, I want to be clear about this. I have heard that this could happen. And there are people, like I said, at Microsoft who could make it happen, that want it to happen. I just don't think it's going to be a success if they do it. And then the, and then the phone comes out. And then the consumer, some, some blogger writes about how the camera's not as good as this. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, and they don't understand for enterprise. Yeah, God help them if they don't sh uh, come to market with the single best smartphone camera in the world because, <laughs> yeah, yep. It's very interesting. Uh, by the way, I, I just saw it was posted on Therat.com. By the way, guys, I'm going to give a little plug here for Therat.com. Mm -hmm. Therat Premium, <laughs> uh, I talk about this all the time. I'm a premium member. I think I'm 23, like the wow. great Michael Jordan, the greatest NBA player of all time. Sorry, Paul. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but the greatest basketball no, player of all time. Uh, greatest I, of his generation, for sure. Of this, I don't. I, 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 I respectfully disagree. The greatest. Yeah, you would because of your age, and you don't have any idea what a really good basketball. Who are you going to go with, but, Dominic but, but Wilkins? What Dominic Wilkins? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you can compare generational basketball players. I mean, um, you know, Larry Bird was absolutely the best player of the '80s. Um, you know, Bill Russell was the best player of the '60s. I'm not sure about the '70s. Um, not, the '90s was Michael Jordan for sure. It has to be. Um, uh, I'm a big Therat fan. I go there every morning. I talk about it. Not not because we're good friends, not because we do a podcast, but it's become one of my go-to sites because it's so easy to understand and read. And I always tell Paul, idiots like me can understand Therat.com. We write, we write for idiots. You write for idiots, and I am that <laughs> that's idiot. The, that's I'm the, the level. Idiot. In, in yeah. Word, there's a setting. It will dumb down what you write. You Actually, you know what's funny? Uh, <laughs> Google punishes you if your website writes above a fifth grade level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it affects your ranking, and as far as how you get ranked, it's it's actually amazing. Right. We're dumbing down language, which is terrible. Um, so sign up for Therat.com. You get access to, obviously, all this stuff, the forum. You get access to these great Therat exclusive articles that Paul writes and Brad puts up. Uh, great stuff. Go to Therat.com and check it out. I'm on there right now, and I'm seeing a post that was just made. Uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft just patented a potential mobile Xbox controller for xCloud. Yeah. Uh, I don't know much about this. I'm really curious by it, so fill me in on it. I mean, I, it's basically what you see in, <laughs> in the picture. I mean, Mo Microsoft has filed a patent for what looks like a mobile um, uh, game controller for its xCloud service. And so it looks like it lo looks to me like something that you can kind of fold up and pop in your pocket or whatever. But it also looks to me a little bit like a... Um, uh, is it a Genesis controller I'm thinking of? It or? does look like a Genesis controller. Yeah, I think Absolutely. it was the yeah because the Master System had the squared off one. Yeah, this yeah. is more like a. So you remember the old Nintendo, the Entertainment Service uh, System, and the um, the original Sega Master System both had kind of small squared off rectangular controllers. This is curved and a little you know a little nice. Yeah, it looks nice. Um, a couple other things I want to get on here. YouTube is back on Fire TV devices. Uh, I find this bizarre how they're deploying this. I, I know that you posted this as well, but have you seen the list of devices that they're that they're supporting off the, uh, as of today? Available as of no, today? I, did, I actually haven't looked at that yet. What, what are they doing today? So it's the Fire Stick Second Gen, the Fire yep. Stick 4K, the Fire TV Cube, the Fire Stick Basic Edition, along with Toshiba Insignia Element and Westinghouse Fire TV Edition TVs. Right. Not the Fire TV 2, which is still still the best Fire TV on the market as far as performance goes. I don't understand why. Uh, I find that really interesting. It's almost like they want to eliminate the Fire TV, the box, from their support line. All right. 
Uh, and I'm curious as to why. Uh, they said more is going to come later on in the year, along with YouTube Kids support, which for me, uh, with kids, that's great. And, of course, YouTube TV. Uh, YouTube TV. Uh, I have YouTube TV. That's going to come later on this year. Uh, this kind of shows how silly these wars are, the content wars between providers. Uh, this all comes down to, you know, essentially between Google and Amazon, their, their beef over content distribution. Also, Amazon Prime video streaming will also be available as of today with Chromecast support. Right, right. Which is good. Uh, do you, you do you think this is stupid? How they you know they're they're holding back? It took a year, Paul, one year for yeah, this yeah. to happen. Um, I think this is just a collateral thing from the fight that these guys are still kind of having, and I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's tough. You know, um, companies like Microsoft have gotten into trouble in the past for bundling things, right? When they have like a dom when they have a dominant product, you bundle like a web browser, media player. It's a problem. Uh, Apple is facing the, that kind of charge today with um, their services and and not allowing people to change defaults. I mean, Google is facing this, has faced the same thing where they promote their own services o over others. So this is kind of like that. Amazon has a a retailing, a retail you know the dominant online retailer, and uh, they, they've just, they decide at one point, well, we're not going to sell uh, Google streamers because they com compete with Fire TV, yeah. right? And it's like, guys, come on! Like, it's the same. It's the same thing. It's 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 sort of it reversed, I guess, because they're not c carrying something instead of bundling it. But um, they will sell you a Fire TV, and so you know these these big companies, um, um, you know, they're gonna fight. I mean, it's just a competitive thing, and unfortunately, the people who lose are the you know the customers. So yeah, it's the consumer. I got a question for you: Are you uh, are you mixed in the environment that you're in? Like, do you have a Fire TV and an Apple TV that you use regularly, or are you in one ecosystem right now? Um, I primarily use a Roku, uh, but we use an Apple TV as well. But just, um, I tend to buy, if I'm going to buy something, uh, like a movie typically would be a movie, but it's also TV shows like, because we don't have, we don't have a TV service. Um, I will do that on Apple for whatever reason. Um, uh, not for whatever reason. I, I, I feel like they're going to be around for the longest <laughs> and keep it going. And if it's a TV show. You know, I might want to, or a movie. I might want to watch it on my iPad when I'm traveling. Yeah, I um, I, I I do Apple as well because that's what's in my living room, and that's where I always rent stuff for the kids, or I'm buying something for the kids. Uh, I do find it interesting. So, by the way, when I, when I say that YouTube is on there, YouTube's been on there. Uh, the the workaround was that fi uh, Amazon have it has the YouTube app. Like it's yeah. the app, but it's actually launching the browser to use their web version, <laughs> right? And it works perfectly yep. fine. Sure, sure. There is no sounds, issues sounds like with something it. we would have done on Windows Phone back I in know. the day. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is no, there is no yeah. issue with it whatsoever. I use that thing every day. That is how I consume media. I rarely watch movies now. I rarely watch TV. All I do is watch people do live commentary and reviews of TV shows. I, I've <laughs> gone down this weird rabbit hole. I just finished Stranger Things. Uh. Uh, oh I watched the whole series, and then I yep. went on YouTube to find to listen to people talk about exactly what I just watched. You know, you just reminded me. I got to write this up. I keep forgetting. You know, there's been uh, uh, in related news. <laughs> this is a little bit of a divergence from what we were talking about, but you know, I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks, and every year, or sometimes twice a year, I'll, I'll just post a story like, "Here's the stuff I've listened to in the past six months, a year, or whatever." You know. And um, there's been an interesting change. I don't know if you noticed this in the podcast space over the past, I'm going to say six months, but it really started a year or two ago with serial and things like that, where long form audio content is appearing as podcasts in episode form yeah. instead of in a single audio book, right? It's, it's, a narrative, uh, it's a narrative depiction of events. Yeah. So uh, to me, for audio content, this very closely mirrors the move away from movies, like a two hour movie about a topic, to a six or 10 or whatever part, you know, uh, Netflix style yeah. TV event, right? So there, there's there been a couple I've listened to recently that are really, really good. Um, Kim Goldman, whose brother was murdered by OJ Simpson, is doing a 10 part series on that. And oh, it's interesting. It is fascinating. Is it, really? and it is. Yeah. And it's really, really well done. Um, my only what, what, quibble, what, how, how do they? Uh, I'm curious. How is it formatted? Like, is she 
telling the story of what happened or is she? So there's a lot of uh, stuff that people don't know about with this case. So like, I mean, look, I mean, I want to be really clear about this. This guy absolutely murdered those people, right? There is literally no doubt about it. And it's way worse than most people think because this all there's all this other information that never came out in the trials or whatever. And she goes back and she talks to all the principal players. I mean, her goal, of course, is to talk to OJ, which I don't believe will ever happen. But um, well, I mean, it, and, it's not going to happen because he's still searching for the killers. Yeah, no, he's really busy doing that because yeah. He's, yeah, he's such a great guy. Um, it, it's fascinating. But um, I, I the one issue I have with it is um, she switches between. There's a I guess there's a paid version where you don't get get ads, but in the normal version, the you don't realize you're listening to an ad until you're like ten seconds into it because it, it switches seamlessly. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I have a little bit of a problem with that, but um, I, I anyway because this thing was and the other oh sorry the other one I should say is uh, there's a six part series I think it is about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos called The Dropout, All, also amazing. And once you listen to something like that, you seek out other things like that, and it it has r- literally done for me with audio what Netflix and original content or HBO or whatever you want to say has done for movies like I kind of like really good stories demand more than 90 minutes or two hours like you you know it has to be bigger than a movie you know and uh it's just I I'll write it up I, I gotta write something about this oh, I love but that. Um, yeah it's very it's very very interesting there's a there's a whole world of content out there all of a sudden that in the past would have been an audiobook you know what we should do uh if you have some time I I mean I'm I'm sitting here in, in this bizarre office i'm going to show it on the post show maybe i'll show it to you some of the stuff in this room is a little inappropriate but i'll show you some of the stuff <laughs> okay uh but on the on the bonus show which we're going to record let's talk about what we're listening to currently mm-hmm. uh i have discovered a um my my wife says i'm like a middle-aged woman now with crime <laughs> with crime dramas like crime yeah. tv yeah, yeah. shows and crime sure. podcasts I absolutely love this stuff. I, I get okay. really into it, and I have discovered I, okay. a couple of these that I really, really like. I have a couple as well, and they um, may be the same ones. And I and I'll and I'll give a shout out to Crime Junkies. Uh, mm-hmm. My wife turned me on to the show, uh, and I believe it's Ashley and Britt, the the hosts of it, and they kind of break down. And it's a very quick format; it's like forty minutes, and they break down uh, major crimes that have happened: missing persons, murders. Unsolved no, issues. Yes, if we're going to talk about this in the after show. We should. We should. Yes, I, but I did want. I did want to give them a shout out on on a larger platform because it, it's actually um, I, I it, it's grown on me. And now I wait for them to kind of do this. They have a Patreon and everything, uh, but I become I became a big fan of their show, and it's interesting because you kind of get sucked into a, a genre or something that you weren't normally listening to, and now now it's like part of what I do. Uh, part of my week, you know, schedule. Mondays, this gets out. Or Tuesdays, this gets out. Um, I do want to talk about what we're consuming now on the bonus mm-hmm. show. You could do that if you're listening to this live. You could check it out. Go to patreon.com slash what the tech and get our bonus content there. Uh, for every dollar you fund us, I um, I I was gonna say something inappropriate. I, I was gonna say <laughs> I was gonna make yep. a joke. I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna I've been told I cannot do that. I was gonna say I'll send you my bath water. Did you hear Yikes. about that girl? That's selling bath water on Patreon. Oh Jesus! This is this no. is the world that we're in, guys. It's it's the end of times. It's the fall of Rome. It this really is, is where we're at right now. We're we're some we're we're some bizarre futuristic depiction of what what the world is like from the eighties to now, and, <laughs> and it's coming true where where people are selling yeah. bath water as as a as a as a means of making a living. It's a crazy universe we're living in. Uh, for all things Paul, go to therot.com. I really enjoy this. It's kind of worked, huh? This setup. What do you what yeah. do you think of this set? Do you want me to build this in your house? I don't really have any place to put that in my house. That's the only problem. But I like it. I mean, I kind of the problem like the stupid thing I have behind me is takes up an entire wall, and you can still I mean it's never straight, so you can see it's rippling over. Well, I guess on that side, whatever. Um, you can see the this side the creases. Oh, yeah, yeah, that crease. side you can see the creases. even though it's humongous, right? Yeah, but why don't you? All you need is one of these panels and just hit like two lights on, and you're good. And then you take it right down. I, I yeah I the, the, right the reason I have this here instead of what I had before was you know that thing we built last time which 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 5, was nice pounds. it was really nice yeah well it's it's built permanently onto the house yeah like it's you know <laughs> the new owners so, must think what yeah. the hell's going on here I told them it was like this is like the our ISIS kill room down here you know <laughs> you guys you never know what you're gonna get into as you get a little older um 
Yeah, so I, I, I'm not going to do that to this house because I know, A, that I'm not going to be here as long as I was in the last one. And I just don't want to, yeah, I just don't have the, I just, just I'm just not doing it. I'm well, I'm going to tell it. you, you could, if you have, a, like, I think it's a window behind you, correct? Yeah. Okay, so you got one of these. You got like a, like a clamp, clamp mm-hmm. the top to like a curtain rod, and right. just drop it down, and you can take it right down. I'm telling you, these things are... That's I mean, what I actually what I would like for this thing to be is a shade. I, I I really what I would really like is to get rid of it when it's I'm not using it. Yeah, yeah, I, it, this yeah. works. I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you off the air. This is this is my yeah. go to when I built studios. This is what I built for Spencer mm. uh, four times. Every time he moves, I go and I build him <laughs> another one. Yep. And I just built one here. And you know you hit a couple lights on it. It kind of looks good if you do it right. Um, yeah. Cheap and dirty. That that's my specialty. Guys. I think it looks great. Yeah, I, I'm I'm actually very impressed how it came out. Uh, go to our website gfknetwork.com. Subscribe to us, guys. Hit us with your Patreon. Patreon.com/slash What the Tech. We're gonna do our bonus show right after this. It's gonna be about what content we're consuming. Uh, we'll release that right after the show. Uh, after we post this, that also goes up on Patreon. You can follow Paul at the Rot. You can follow me at Andrew Zarian. And that's it for this week. Take care. <laughs>